Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta and our, our playlist, Understanding the Magdalene. Of course, right now we're going through Margaret Starbird's bo book, The, the Woman, Woman with the Alabaster Jar. Now, yes, of course, there are many problems with this book. Uh, I would say that they're not necessarily Margaret Starbird's fault, uh, just the, the, the time period in which she wrote this book, there was definitely some information missing from our culture and from our society regarding Magdalene and Yahshua, regarding the crucifixion, and of course, regarding the geography of where all of this stuff really took place. But before we go any further into this reading and into this discussion, I would like to first and foremost give a very, very special, special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers on this channel. Without you guys, this channel would absolutely not be possible. So I personally thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box below. And before we get into the subject at hand, a word from one of our sponsors. All right, you guys, once again, welcome to this section of our Understanding the Magdalene playlist where we are looking at the woman with the alabaster jar. We're going to be looking at and discussing chapter one, which is titled The Lost Bride. Based on fourth century legend preserved in Old French, Magdalene has said is said to have brought the Seine Graal to the southern coast of France. It was asserted in later legends that this Seine Graal was the Holy Grail a chalice. In fact, it was said in later versions to have been the very cup from which Yahshua drank at the Last Supper on the night of his arrest. Well, first and foremost, there was no Last Supper because Yahshua was never crucified. There also was no Last Supper because Yahshua himself would not have been participating in Passover because Yahshua was Egyptian. Yes, he did have Jewish students. And yes, there was a Jewish prophecy that said there would be two teachers, not one, that would come to help change the timeline, the Magdalene and Yeshua. But they, the prophecy didn't necessarily say they were going to be Jewish. Uh, both Magdalene and Yeshua were, were the Essenes, which Essene, if you know, you've been on this channel for a while, the spelling of Isis was E-S-S-E -S -S -E back in that time. So the scenes are the priest and priesthood of Isis. They are Egyptian. Now, also something very, very important. Of course, the name Magdalene does refer to a chalice or a womb, a womb with a, a, a like as in a woman, as in your uterus. Um, and it, it Sun Graal is the holy bloodline. But the one thing that we've been very confused about, in my opinion, we're not talking about Yahshua's bloodline. That was an assumption that was made because Magdalene got demoted to that of the prostitutes. The holy bloodline they're talking about is Magdalene's bloodline. Why? Because Magdalene carried the bloodline of Atlantis. We see this because their descendants were called the Merovingians. They weren't called the Yasavingians, they were called the Merovingians, meaning the descendants of Magdalene. She was the holy bloodline. Not just her womb, but her, Magdalene. She was the bloodline of Atlantis. In the past, people have assumed it was the cup that Jesus drank out of, which is kind of bullshit. Well, we know it's bullshit. But we're going to go on to see what legend had stated about this chalice. The grail was re revered as one of the most holy relics in all of Christendom. But sadly, according to the legends, it was somehow lost and has remained hidden up to the present time. The king is wounded and crippled, goes the myth. And the kingdom has become a wasteland because the grail is lost. 
The story promises that when the sacred vessel that once contained the blood of Christ is found, the king will be healed and all will be well. Is there anyone in Christendom who has not heard of the search of the grail? Anyone who has not sorrowed for its loss? Again, the grail is the Atlantean bloodline. Some of the later European legends say that Joseph of Arimathea caught the blood of the dying Yahshua in a chalice and brought it to Western Europe by boat during the early persecution of the followers of Yahshua in Jerusalem. That's kind of gross, right? Like, that's the drinking of blood, to catch blood in a chalice. That's why we need to start rethinking this whole crucifixion and communion type thing. I mean, that is literally them preparing you to worship a satanic ritual of sacrificing a human, doing a blood ritual, and then eating the body and the blood. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. The God that I worship would never want you to do, to do that. But Lucifer wants you to do that. That's why the God of the Bible is Lucifer. One chronicler preserves the story that Joseph of Arimathea brought two crutes containing the blood and sweat of Yahshua to Glastonbury in southwest England, along with a staff of hawthorn that sprouted and bloomed when it was planted in English soil, the flowering staff. Other sources relate that Joseph carried the sacred Sangrau to the Mediterranean coast of France, which we know, sorry for our people in the country of France, that's not the real France. My opinion, from my research, the real France is Canada. So it makes me think maybe there's something about the Great Lakes that could be seen as the ancient Mediterranean. I don't know. What are y'all's thoughts on that? The various legends have given rise to numerous works of poetry through the cities, many linking the Grail to King Arthur and his round table of knights who searched for the sacred chalice throughout Europe. The bottom line of all the lore is that the grail is holy and that it is worth searching for, and it is lost or hidden and that it has healed the wasteland if ever to be found. It's lost and hidden because it's inside of you, boo, like, you, like the ten missing tribes of Israel. Once you figure that out, once you figure out you're Atlantean, you're the holy grail, the descendants of the Atlanteans, then we heal. The controllers can't control us anymore. All are agreed the grail is a Christian relic, holy because it was touched by Yahshua himself. It is the most sacred and most elusive artifact in all of Western civilization. But interestingly enough, the Roman Catholic Church has always been less enthusiastic about the grail and its legend. It was suggested by author E. Waite and other students of the subject, that the grail mystery and its adherents provide an alternative to the Orthodox version of Christianity, and that the priesthood of this other Christianity derives its authority directly from Yahshua himself without sanction of the church. No wonder that the church tried to suppress the Holy Grail and its legends. The faith of our fathers. Any version of Christianity that provides an alternative to the doctrines of the Orthodox church could be considered an atheum. This is the definition of heresy. The question of heresy does not hinge on truth, but rather on whether or not the doctrine is in line with the official statement of faith. We've talked about this. So heresy basically means something that goes against the official narrative. So most of you on this channel would be considered by definition heretics because you've gone against the official narrative that's been portrayed in medicine, in education. So heresy itself really is, is not a bad word. It's actually a pretty good word. It just means you're going against the controlled narrative. Those who have been brought up in Orthodox Christianity have been carefully taught to accept its doctrines on faith and have always assumed that these doctrines must constitute the one true version. However, there were several parallel versions of Christianity from the very beginning each with its own beliefs and interpretations of the gospel message. Over the centuries, the message of Yahshua was institutionalized. Doctrines were gradually developed, and it did not always reflect the faith of the early Jewish Christians of the first century Palestine, which again, we need to put in the Egyptians, because Yahshua was Egyptian. 
The official version of Christianity, which gradually evolved and was articulated by the church councils of 3rd and 4th century AD, was based on the consensus of the Christian elders present at the council, often with pressure from the reigning Roman emperor or other political factions. These councils voted on the articulation of doctrine, such as the nature of the Trinity, the divinity of Yeshua, the virginity of Mary, and the nature of the God health head itself. And so Yeshua's mother's name was Alma Mari, not Mary. Mary was a derogatory name, and Alma Mari was not a virgin. Let's be very clear about that. The birth that they want you to venerate in the church is a rape story where a demon comes in and impregnates a woman. This is what they do in satanic rituals. The true sex magic, the true ritual of conceiving a child through God is with your husband. So let's be real clear about that. The church has inverted literally everything. When you go to church, you are worshiping Lucifer. Facts. Straight up facts. They decided which scriptures were from Jewish canon, were to be considered canonical by Christians, and which gospels and epistles of the early church were to be included in the Bible. It was these patriarchs who decided which gospels reflected the authentic teachings and biography of Yahshua, and which letters of Paul and of the early church leaders should be included among the official scriptures. One criterion for selection into the official canon of scripture was the writing must be authentic work of one of the apostles of Yahshua. On this basis, the Gospel of Matthew and John in the book of Revelation, called the Apocalypse of John, were proclaimed canonical, although recent scholarship suggests that in all likelihood, none of the books were actually written by an apostle of Yahshua. No, they were written by King James, y'all. They were legit. They were written by King James and the Freemasons. In fact, a number of scholars consider unlikely that any of the writers of the four Gospels ever knew the historical Yeshua of Nazareth at all. And he wasn't from Nazareth. Naz Nazareth, he was from Egypt. Of course they didn't know him. The Freemasons wrote it with King James. I'll put that, that video down in the description box below if you missed it. In addition, there is evidence that portions of these four Gospels were deleted, added, and perhaps even censored over the centuries. Of course they were. It is hard in light of these facts to view the existing canon of Scripture as the only possible version of the Word of God. The official version of Christianity that was articulated by the early church council is the same one that has been handed down through the centuries, the so-called faith of our fathers. This is the Orthodox version, but is not necessarily the one and only version of the Christian faith, nor is it necessarily true. This is the question we want to examine. Is there another story of Yahshua that might be closer to the truth than the version propagated by the church during the Middle Ages before the Protestant Reformation? Was there an alternative version of Christian doctrine? Could there have been an alternative church? If so, what were the tenets of its faith? And what was the relationship to the early Christian message and to Yahshua himself? The sun grawl. Medieval poets write, writing in the 12th century, when the Grail legend first surfaced in European literature, mentioned a Grail family, presumably the custodians of the chalice, who were later found unworthy of its privilege. A connection is sometimes drawn by Grail scholars between the sun growl and the grandalis, a word that seems to have been cut platter or basin in the Provencal language, but it has also been suggested that if one breaks the word sangral after the G, the result is sangral, which in Old French means blood royal. The second derivation of the French sangral is extremely provocative and perhaps enlightening. Suddenly one is faced with a new reading of a familiar legend. Instead of a cup or chalice, the story now states that Magdalene brought the royal blood to the Mediterranean coast of France. Other legends credit Joseph of Arimathea with bringing the blood of Yahshua to France in some kind of vessel. Perhaps it was really Magdalene, under the protection of Joseph of Arimathea, who carried the royal bloodline of David the king to the Mediterranean coast of France. Oh, Margaret Starber, nope, nope. 
nope, not David the King. We don't want any fucking thing to do with David the King. They were Satanist. They were they were committing child sacrifices in Lucifer's name, in Moloch's name, in Yahweh's name. Not David the King. Those are the Cabal families. The house of Judah, the line of Judah is galactic. It's Lyran. And Mary wasn't carrying the royal bloodline because she was pregnant with Yahshua's kid. She was carrying the royal bloodline because the royal bloodline pumped through her veins as an Atlantean. She literally is the Atlantean bloodline. It's all about Magdalene. Who is this Magdalene known to the early Christians as the Magdalene? And how could she have brought the blood royal to France? Because it was in her veins. Not just her womb, but in her veins. Could it be that the royal blood was carried in an earthen vessel? vessel? If that earthen vessel was a woman, perhaps this Magdalene was actually the wife of Yahshua and brought a child of his to province, a child of hers and his, but hers, y'all, she's the bloodline. It's got nothing to do with Yahshua. It never did. She was Yahshua's teacher. She woke Yahshua up. Have we really never thought about this? Are we really so conditioned to think that the only value of divinity can come through a man if we think that the only blood of value could come through a man then we are still very 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 heavily programmed into the cabal we got to rethink this whole thing both of the new testament genealogies of yahshua insist that the charismatic teacher who descended from king david he did not descend from king david that's a lie he did not and the Masonic promises to Israel are specifically tied to the royal blood of her Judaic prince descended from the root of Jesse, the father of King David. Nope. The wife of Jesse, if she bore him a child, would have been quite literally the bearer of the Sangral, the royal bloodline of Israel. She, it's the royal bloodline of Israel because the real 12 tribes of Israel are galactic. Not. Not Abrahamic. If you're still supporting the Abrahamic bloodlines in the Bible, you are still protecting the Satanist and the Cabal. Something you really need to have down and have a little think, sit down and have a little think about. The quest for the Holy Grail is a mystery that is centuries old. Clues that link Magdalene with the Sengrel of the ancient legends are bound in art, literature, and folklore of the Middle Ages, as well as in the unfolding events of history and in scripture itself. Many of these clues will be discussed in the following chapters in an attempt that shows the Bride of Yahshua was perhaps accidentally left out of the story as a result of political turmoil in the province of Israel following the crucifixion. It was political turmoil, all right, but there was no crucifixion. I know of no way to prove beyond a doubt that the other Mary was the, the wife of Yahshua or that she bore a child of his bloodline, her bloodline, not his bloodline, her bloodline. But it is possible to prove that the belief in this version of Christianity's story was widespread in Europe during the Dark and Middle Ages. Yes, because the Dark and Middle Ages were Tartaria. <laughs> when the Merovingians were ruling, her descendants were ruling. And that it was later forced underground by the ruthless tortures of the Inquisition. In our search, we must identify and examine the evidence of the alternative church, the Church of the Holy Grail, found in fossils and symbols in European art and literature and the New Testament Gospels themselves. So who was Magdalene? Our first step will be to establish the identity of the quote-unquote other Mary found in the four Gospels. There is strong evidence to suggest that Mary Magdalene can be identified as Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha, Martha and Lazarus mentioned in the Gospel of Luke and John. No, this is actually the second time me reading this because I lost the footage the first time. And we've talked about this. Y'all, y'all, Magdalene and Mary of Bethany are just both call her Bethany because Mary is derogatory name. Magdalene and Bethany are two separate women. I know she's going to conclude they're the same. They are not the same. They are. This is why, y'all, this is why they gave every woman in the New Testament the name Mary. Because they wanted us to be fucking confused. Why did they want us to be fucking confused? Because Magdalene holds the bloodline. It's not Yahshua. Magdalene holds the bloodline. So let's mix her up in the mix with all these women and make it about her husband. And then, boom, we have a problem. We don't know the truth. 
Also, Margaret Starbird, if you're listening, read the missing books of the Bible, girl. The missing books of the Bible. For those in the back who can't hear, the missing books of the Bible, they tell you everything you need to know. Okay? Missing books of the Bible. Acts of Philip. In the Acts of Philip, you meet Bethany. Bethany, or as you want to call her, Mary Bethany. Sorry, Bethany, because I know that Mary is a derogatory name. Um, she was Philip's wife. In the Acts of Philip, you get to meet her. Girl was real sassy. I like Bethany. Like, like Bethany was one of those girls that you, you want to go to New York City with and you want to go hit up all the bars and have margaritas with because she was fun. She was a socialite. She was not Magdalene, though. These were two separate women. I know you're about to say they're the same, but that just shows your lack of research. But we'll read it anyway, but it shows your lack of research. Missing books of the Bible has all the answers you need. It's all in there. Okay. This gentle Mary sat at the feet of Yeshua while her sister Martha, 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 <laughs> bustled around serving their guests and she was later anointed Yahshua with nard biblical references to magdalene include the information that she was one of the women who accompanied Yahshua after he healed her of possessions by seven demons well we know that's bullshit <laughs> if you've been on this channel for a while magdalene manuscript makes it real clear what is not the number seven y'all y'all it's the chakras It's not literal demons. He balanced her chakras with some Reiki. And as it says in the Mar in the Magdala manuscript, she balanced his as well. <laughs> Yashua's chakras were a little off too, so she did her Reiki and balanced him as well. She is also reported to have been one of the women at the foot of the cross and one of the women to arrive at the tomb at the first light on Easter morning. Yes, she was the one that arrived at the tomb, Magdalene, because she was his Visca Pisces. She was his, his wife. And because they were Egyptians, every year they would reenact the story of Tammuz and Ishtar. And so the men, the messiahs, the men, because messiah basically means a penis like your husband. Let me make that clear, though. Let's specify, like, what is the difference between a messiah and just a penis? In our modern language, we call them fuckboys and, like, your soulmate, your twin flame. So, like, your messiah would be, like, your, your twin flame or your soulmate. The other penises are just fuckboys, right? Does that make sense in, like, modern language? <laughs> so not every man's a messiah for you. Every man's a messiah for one woman, but not for you. Yeshua was Magdalene's Messiah, not yours. Magdalene was his best Visca Pisces. And so every year, we spoke about this in the Mardi Gras episode. I'll put that down in the description box below. But every single year, they would reenact this. The men of the high priest and the, and the um, priesthood of Isis would reenact Tammuz coming to the underworld, which is Earth. For three days, they would go off and be in their caves, and then their Visca Pisces, the high priestess, their wives, would come and get them out. So that is why Magdalene was at his tomb. She was getting her husband out. It was time to come back home. She knew he was alive. God, they've tried to really make this story very idiotic, but it's very simple once you know the truth. The Gospel of John said that she came alone to the tomb and encountered Yahshua, at first believing him to be the gardener. She even reached out to embrace him when she recognized him calling Rabboni, an affectionate word for the word rabbi. Obviously, this Mary, called the Magdalene, was an intimate friend and companion of Yahshua. She was not Mary. Let's stop that. Stop it. Stop it. Stop calling these women derogatory names. Her name was Magdalene. The Western Church is an old and very strong tradition supporting the suggestion that there was only one cherished friend of Yahshua called Mary. Nope. Magdalene, we got to stop it. Stop calling them bad names. That's not, not nice. You don't want to be called a bad name. Don't call them bad names. 
The biblical Song of Solomon, often interpreted in this Judeo-Christian tradition at the beginning, an allegory of God's love for people, was immensely popular during Christ for Christians during the Middle Ages. Saint Bernard, Bernard of Clairvaux, hope I said that right. Listen, I've talked about this with Nicole. French words, like you don't say half of them, so I never know when to stop saying the word. <laughs> and I studied French. In his sermon on the Canticles of Canticles, the Song of Songs, he equates that the bride of the song symbolically with the church and with the soul of each believer. The prototype he selects to illustrate this bride of Christ is Magdalene, or Mary rather. He's talking about Bethany now, the sister of Lazarus, who sat before the feet of Yahshua, absorbing his teachings, and who later anointed his feet with nard and dried them with her hair. But St. Bernard also says repeatedly in his sermons that it's possible of this Mary of Bethany is the same as the Magdalene. Again, nope, St. Bernard would have known this because he probably was a Satanist. He probably was aware of all the missing Gospels and that this is just a confusion tactic. Magdalene did have siblings. But she was not Martha and Lazarus' sibling. Her father had children from a previous relationship, but she was the only child of her mother and her father. She had half-siblings, and she was the youngest. 900 years before St. Bernard, a Christian theologian in Alexandria named Origen equated Magdalene specifically with the Bride in the Song of Songs. This association was broadly accepted and cherished in the Middle Ages. The Gospel of John clearly identifies the woman who anointed Yahshua with her precious, precious unjit as the sister of Lazarus, and French traditionally explicitly calls the Magdalene the sister of Lazarus. Magdalene was not his sister, Bethany was. The Roman Catholic Church does not even have a feast day for this Mary of Bethany, although Martha's feast day is celebrated, and that of Lazarus is still honored on the Anglican calendar. One would expect the church would celebrate this favorite sister, by honoring her with a feast as it does for the other friend of Yahshua. There is a feast day for Magdalene celebrated July 22nd, exactly one week before the Feast of Martha. It also seems natural and correct to give the more important of the sister saints the prior feast day. Listen, we don't need to be using any of the church to validate anything. The only thing we need to look at church records for is to see where they lied. <laughs> The only reason why I still have a Bible is to reference where the lies are. That's it. Do not take anything the church says seriously. Because all the church is trying to do is confuse you. Again, church comes from the Scottish word Kirk, which comes from the Greek goddess Circe. Her job was to mind control you and then eat you. The church's job is to scramble your mind, confuse you, create vulnerability in you, and then eat you. For centuries, the official uh, literature scripture passage of the Roman Catholic Church on the Feast Day of Magdalene was read from the Chronicles of Chronicles, which by association equated the Magdalene with the Black Bride described in the song. In the 6th century, Pope St. Gregory I proclaimed that Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany were the same person. This was also the Pope that said Magdalene was a prostitute. So we really should not be taking, I mean, once a liar, always a liar. Like that's my view anyway. Like lie to me once, shame on you. Lie to me twice and I believe you, shame on me. Like he already taught a big whopper of a lie that he knew wasn't true. So we're going to take him seriously with this. Listen, I'm Margaret Starbird, did you have problems dating? Because you seem to be falling for some lies that are pretty obvious, girl. 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 He's lying. Pope Gregory the First was notoriously a liar. We shouldn't take him seriously. But anyway, he goes on to say, we believe that one of Luke's we believe that the one Luke calls the sinner and John names Mary is the same of whom, according to Mark, seven devils were expelled. The sacred prostitute. That's the next section, the sacred prostitute. While two gospels, those of Mark and Luke, maintain that Mary Magdalene was healed by Yahshua of possession by seven demons, nowhere does it say she was a prostitute. Exactly. And this, it wasn't seven demons. It was balancing her chakras, which is something most of us try to do every fucking day. So, 
God, they must be just shaking their heads on the other side. Like these dumbasses, like these literally these dumbasses. And yet this stigma has fallen her throughout Christendom. The original story of the anointing of Yahshua at Bethany by the woman with the alabaster jar may have been misinterpreted by the author of Luke's gospel, writing nearly 50 years after the event, probably a little bit more than 50 years. Let's be honest. Probably more of like a fictional story made up by King James and the Freemasons in order to control people. The anointing performed by the woman at Bethany was similar to the familiar ritual practice of the sacred priestess or temple prostitute and the goddess cult of the Roman Empire. Even the term prostitute is a misnomer. This term chosen by modern translators is applied to the Herodule, or sacred woman of the temple of the goddess, who played an important part in the everyday life of the classical world. As priestesses of the goddess, their important dates back through the centuries of the Neolithic period, back to a time when God was honored and cherished as feminine throughout the lands known as the Middle East and Europe. Yes, that I, so that is what Magdalene was. She was the sacred woman of the, of the temple. She was a high priestess of Isis. That is correct. That is absolutely correct. And that's why I'm saying we're forgetting when they talk about the royal bloodline, we're thinking it's Yahshua. We've been conditioned to think it's Yahshua. But in this time, out of the men and women, which two were seen as superior? Women. Y'all. Y'all. It's not Yahshua's bloodline. <laughs> it's Magdalene's. Wrong bloodline. Wrong parent. We're looking for the mom. Not the dad. In the ancient world, sexuality was considered sacred, a special gift from the goddess of love. And the priestess who officiated the temples of the love goddess in the Middle East were considered holy by the citizens of the Greek and Roman empires, known as the consecrated woman. They were held in high esteem as invokers of the love, ecstasy, and fertility of goddess. At some periods of Jewish history, they were even part of the rich, uh, ritual worship in the temple of Jerusalem. Although some of the prophets of Yahweh deplored the influence of the great goddess locally called Asherah. Yahweh is Moloch. That's in the missing books of the Old Testament. Abraham. Jacob. Moses. Noah. David. Samson. Solomon. All worships Moloch. Now, some people will use the name Yahweh just in ignorance. They don't know. But there are some truthers out there who are pretending, using, really trying to control the fundamentalists by using the name Yahweh. They know what they're doing. They know full well Yahweh is Moloch. And they're trying to get you to worship Moloch. The same Moloch Hillary Clinton worships in those emails that were leaked. Wake up. Wake up. Take your power back. Read the missing books of the Bible. It's all there. It's all there. This discovery in Israeli archaeological digs of virtually thousands of figurines of the Sumerian Canaanite goddess of love, holding her breast cup in her hands, has convinced experts that the worship of the Hebrew versions of this goddess was commonplace in ancient Israel. The priestess of the love goddess was a familiar sight in every city of the Roman Empire, including Jerusalem. In the gospel context, the woman with the alabaster jar of Ugent may have been one of these priestesses because Magdalene was a priestess. But curiously, Yahshua does not seem to have been at all affronted by her actions when she anointed him. He even told his friends gathered at the banquet in the house of Simon that the woman had anointed him for burial, for a fake burial because they were reenacting Tammuz and Ishtar. There was no crucifixion. 
Seriously, just research this. It's it's all out there. It's you can find it. The significance of this statement cannot possibly have been misunderstood by the early Christian communities, which preserved the story in its oral tradition. The anointing for burial was the enactment of a key part of the cult ritual of dying and rising sun and the fertility gods of the whole region washed by the Mediterranean Sea. The anointing by the woman with the alabaster jar was familiar to the citizens of the empire because the cultic rituals of their love goddess. But in more ancient times, the anointing of the sacred king was a unique privilege of the royal bride, the Messiah, and the Visica Pisces. For millennia, this same action had been part of an actual marriage rite performed by a daughter of the royal house, and the marriage rite itself conferred kingship on her consort. In those remote times, up until about the 3rd millennium BC, most of the societies of the Near Middle East had been martillennial, coming from the mother, with property and possession passed through the mother and female kinship. In fact, among the royal houses of such of this region, this practice contained well into classic times. Both the Queen of Sheba and Cleopatra of Egypt ruled as dynastic heiresses. In Palestine, almost contemporarily with Yahshua, the Edomite king Herod the Great claimed the throne of Israel on the basis of his marriage to Marion, a descendant of the Hamanon house of the Maccabees the last legitimate rulers in Palestine. Yes, that's what I'm telling you guys. We have to go back to what it was like then. Magdalene was the royal bloodline. She was also the Christ. It's Magdalene's bloodline. But before we go into the next section, the cults of the sacrificed king, a word from one of our sponsors. So many messages from you guys saying how much you love the ASEA and I myself am so excited to try the product and get it started. We're all looking for a, a way to help boost our vibration and our understanding of the world around you. If you want more information on the ASEA product, down in the description box, you can text Jay from Spiritually Raw. Just text him at the number listed below, Bryce Info, and he will send you more information on the product. All right, Cults of the Sacrificed King. Vestiges, vestiges of ancient millennial practices and goddess worship lingered in the first century in the Hellenized Roman providence of Palestine. One respiratory of these ancient myths and customs was the cults of the fertility gods of the region. The anointing by the woman in the Gospels is remnants of the love poetry connected with the rites of sacred marriage, celebrating the union of a local god and goddess. It is not impossible that the true meaning of the anointing at Bethany was the same, the sacred marriage of the sacrificed king. Ishtar Tammuz, Yeshua Magdalene. Its mythological content would have been understood by the Hellenized community of Christians who heard the gospels preached in the cities of the Roman Empire where the cults of the love goddess were not completely extinguished until the end of the 5th century AD. In the Gospel of John, the woman, the bride, named in connection with this anointing is, they say Mary of Bethany, no, Magdalene. Bethany might have been there to assist and help as a high priestess herself. Magdalene and Bethany are two different women. And yet it was always the Magdalene who is pictured in Western art carrying the alabaster jar of precious ointment, and it is on her feast day the Roman Catholic Church traditionally reads from the canonical Song of Songs, the story of the bride searching for the bridegroom beloved from whom she has become separate. In medieval and Renaissance paintings, it is invariably the Magdalene we see, her hair unbound at the foot of the cross, 
with the mother of Yahshua, and is he she who kisses the feet of Yahshua in the painting of the disposition, the removal of Yahshua from the cross, which is pure fantasy. These paintings recall for us the mythologies of several pagan sun fertility gods, Osiris, Tammuz, and Adonis, who were slain in resurrection. In each case, the bereaved widow Isis, Ishtar, and Aphrodite point out her grief and desolation over the corpse of her beloved, bitterly laminating his death. Egyptian mythology, for example, relates that Isis, the sister bride of Osiris, prayed over his mutilated body and conceived his son Horus posthumously. She wasn't a sister bride. She wasn't his actual sister. That means twin flame. In each cult, it is the bride who eliminates the death of the sacrificed god. In poetry, used in cultic worship, the goddess Isis, some lines are identical with those found in the Chronicles and other close paraphrases. More recently, scholars have noticed similarities between the erotic imaginary of the canonicals and love poetry of ancient Babylon, Sumner, and Canaan. The evidence has been discovered on cuneiform tablets in ancient temples and archives in this century. Yeah, Song of Songs in, in the Bible is like the porno. It's very juicy. The lost bride of the Christian tradition rests just below the surface of these more ancient myths and stories. There's a very old tradition identifying Mary of Bethany with Mary of Magdalene in Western church. Nope, still different woman. No matter how, no matter how many times the controllers try to make them the same woman to confuse us, there's still just always going to be two different women. In medieval art, this woman is also identified with the sister bride of the ancient mythologies. The concept of the sister bride of these myths is extremely important to our story. The bride, the moon or earth goddess of antiquity, was the spouse of the sun god, but she was much more than that. She was the intimate friend and partner of her bridegroom deity. His mirror image or other half, a feminine alter ego or twin sister, for this reason, the symbol of the mirror is retained in the iconography of the goddess. The archetypal bridegroom just could not be whole without her. Ying yang, sun, moon, twin flames. The relationship of these two was much more than a sexual union. It was a deep spiritual intimacy and kingship summoned by the word sister. The sacred marriage of the bridegroom with the sister bride was not limited to the physical passion. It was a marriage of the deepest spiritual and emotional ecstasy as well. And apparently that is true. When you are in a relationship with your twin, once you've both worked on your shit, apparently it's ecstasy. Not just in the bedroom, but your relationship in general is like you literally have your other half. So they say. I don't know from experience, but so they say. Christians in the early church readily identified Magdalene with the dark sister bride the Song of Songs found in the canonical Judeo-Christian scriptures. In the book entitled Venus in Sackcloth, Marjorie Melvern examines the metaphors of Magdalene from prostitute to counterpart friend of Yahshua through two millennium of Western art and literature. In this book, Malvern shows the shift in art of the 12th century, which began to depict Magdalene as the partner of Yahshua in the mode and mythology of Venus Aphrodite and other love goddesses who dom whose who domains were fertility and marriage. Malvern suggests that this shift was the result of a contact with the love poetry of the Arab world at the time of the Crusades. She notices that this intimacy was later suppressed in the 13th century, that the mother of Yasha was, was elevated to the prominent status that she did not enjoy in the gospel themselves. Yeah, she was just the mom. Listen. I don't have kids. But if I had a son, I hope that I would back off when my son had a wife. Mamas need to back off when their sons have wives. She also notes that the enthusiasm of the Middle Ages for the Passion Plays of the period of the People's particular fascination with scenes enacting the anointing of Bethany and the encounter of the Magdalene with the risen Yahshua in the garden. 
I believe that it was the spread of heresy of the Holy Grail that caused this surprising transformation of Magdalene from prostitute to sister bride in artistic representation during the 12th century. The Magdalene depicted in many of these medieval paintings was not a repentant sinner or a reformed prostitute, nor was she merely a friend of Yahshua. She was his beloved. Many people may be inclined to reject the idea that Yahshua was married to Magdalene. She says the sister of Lazarus. Lazarus was not Magdalene's sister. Their reason for this is very simple. They believe that the Gospels would have told us if Yahshua had been married. Yet, even a close examination of the scriptures reveals much evidence in support of this marriage. The lost books of the Bible tell you straight up she was his wife, so... Perhaps then we should begin our search by looking closely at the Song of Songs, whose allegorical interpretation does not hide the intensely erotic imaginary of love. I'm telling you, it's the porno of the Bible, the Song of Songs. We will also want to examine the let me off of the bride and the bridegroom in Hebrew scriptures and in the Christian gospels. We will continue later with the quest for the Holy Grail. But first, let's study the ancient rite of the sacred marriage celebrating the lands of the Middle East and in the canonical of the archetypal bride and bridegroom. I'm telling you, if I ever get married, I kind of want to do marriage like they did it back then. I don't want to do this matrixy cabal shit in my wedding. I I want to get married like Magdalene and Yashua were married, if I ever get married. So anyway, guys, let me know your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. I know this stuff is really hard to hear, like when you've been conditioned to believe something so hardcore and then something comes in and says, wait a minute, let's look at this in a different perspective. I know that's hard to hear. And I thank you guys for being patient and for being loving and supporting in the comment section. If this is triggering you, don't project that onto me or to other people. You can ask questions. But if it's triggering you, that's a you problem. That's not a me problem. That's not other people in the comment section problem. That's a you problem. And so I would ask that you just sit with that trigger and, and ask it what it wants you to know. It's all going to be okay. That I can promise you. All right, you guys. I'll talk to you soon.